It was the haunting final masterpiece by Stanley Kubrick, a film of sexuality, identity, and secrecy, which actually describes both the movie's themes and its production. Shrouded in mystery with tightly secured sets, mock therapy sessions, hypnotic filming techniques, and more, Eyes Wide Shut was the last film Kubrick would complete. But is it even finished? Or is the greatest mystery of all what the finished film was meant to be? Let's utter the secret password to find out what the f*** happened to this movie. Following 1968's 2001 A Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick was looking for his next project, maybe one that wouldn't confuse the hell out of nearly every viewer. Kubrick came across the 1926 novella Dream Story, which Jay Cox purchased the rights to on Kubrick's behalf. The book would get discarded for another, Anthony Burgess's A Clockwork Orange, although Kubrick would retain the rights. In 1994, a whole seven years after the release of Kubrick's previous film, Full Metal Jacket, the director renewed his interest in Dream Story, which is filled with complex themes of which Kubrick boiled down to, it asks the question, is there a serious difference between dreaming a sexual adventure and actually having one? Kubrick teamed with screenwriter Frederick Raphael, who won an Oscar for 1965's Darling. He had tried to recruit Full Metal Jacket co-writer Michael Herr, but Herr declined, worried it would be a long production. Oh, he had no idea. There would be significant changes that would have to be made, including moving the location from Vienna to New York City and altering the lead character names from Fridolin and Albertina to Bill and Alice. It would also remove any elements of the characters being Jewish and swap the setting from Carnival, which begins in November, to Christmas time. So yes, Eyes Wide Shut is Christmas adjacent, which is also the term for what Die Hard is, by the way. Welcome to the party, pal! Kubrick and Raphael supposedly worked for upwards of 18 hours a day until the script was complete, or could at least serve as a blueprint for the film. Scenes were constantly being rewritten. When it came to casting, Warner Brothers demanded Kubrick cast a marquee star as he did with Jack Nicholson in The Shining. Kubrick went for real-life couple Alec Baldwin and Kim Basinger, but soon backed away. Uh, maybe the director changed his mind after seeing The Getaway. You'd humiliate yourself for me, wouldn't you? After a fateful meeting between Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, Kubrick cast them as Bill and Alice, the couple who faces a marriage crisis over the holiday season after Alice admits she had a sexual fantasy about another man. One caveat of signing on for Eyes Wide Shut was that both actors were barred from working on any other projects. But Alec Baldwin and Tom Cruise weren't always at the top of the list. Kubrick actually once considered Steve Martin and Woody Allen for the lead. Hey, at least Woody and Tom could fit in the same wardrobe. Other names that were reportedly tossed around were Bill Murray, Albert Brooks, and Harrison Ford. Bill's surname, Harford, serves as a nod to Harrison Ford. Harvey Keitel and Jennifer Jason Leigh were both originally cast, but later replaced by Sidney Pollack and Marie Richardson, respectively, due to scheduling. Keitel, however, maintains that he was fired. Kiss on this f***ing turd. On the trivia front, Kate Blanchett has an uncredited voice cameo. She would later be directed in Tar by Todd Field, who played nightclub pianist Nick Nightingale. It was actually while filming Eyes Wide Shut that Cruz convinced Todd Field to get into directing. With a budget of $65 million, production on Eyes Wide Shut began in November 1996. This is where you should note that the film came out in July 1999. Production took place in England even though the film is set in New York City, including on sound stages at Pinewood Studios best known for housing many Bond productions. Kubrick used techniques both inventive and downright befuddling to capture the essence of New York City. In some cases, head-on shots of Tom Cruise walking used rear projection, with the actor on a treadmill. So not only is Tom Cruise not walking in New York, he's not even walking in London. To get the precise look of Manhattan, Kubrick had crew members fly over to the States and measure the width of the city streets. To break it down, no, that's not FAO Schwartz, it's Hamleys, and no, that's not Greenwich Village, it's the Hatton Garden area. The notoriously secretive Kubrick employed a small crew of local obeyers and a tight set with security and secured locations. Well, mostly. One story goes that a caterer was fired for having a camera on hand. To get to the core of the film, the relationship between Cruz and Kidman's characters, Kubrick had low-key therapy-type sessions where they would discuss their actual marriage. To maximize emotions, at times he would split the couple up. In one case, Kubrick had Kidman shoot nude footage with a male model, forbidding Cruz from any information of what happened. However, the actors did sleep in their own character's bedroom. They were even allowed to pick out the curtain colors. Also on the production design front, the Harford's apartment was modeled exactly after Kubrick's own, with paintings done by his wife. 
As Cruz put it, it was as personal a story as he's ever done. Hey, better than a clockwork orange. This would be no surprise, as Kubrick was an infamous perfectionist, and some may say abusive tyrant. It got to extremes while filming, as he shot and reported 95 takes of Tom Cruise walking through a door. Sure, he can scale skyscrapers and cling to planes, but walking through a door? Not so easy. Cruise would later claim he developed ulcers while filming the movie. Another instance of extensive shooting involved Vanessa Shaw's prostitute character, Domino. What should have been a two-week shoot turned into two months. Filming on Eyes Wide Shut concluded in January 1998, uh, sort of, as reshoots were needed in May. Production drew on for so long that one producer at the time said, The crew thinks it's a nightmare. Everyone's hoping to get fired. When all was said and done, the film set the Guinness World Record for longest unbroken film shoot, as Eyes Wide Shut, quote, was in production for over 15 months, including an unbroken shoot lasting 46 weeks. Nice flex, Stanley. After a lengthy editing phase, Stanley Kubrick showed Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman a cut of the film. Less than one week later, on March 7, 1999, Stanley Kubrick died of a heart attack. Some claim that the film was unfinished at the time of his death, while others say it just needed some tidying up. Co-writer Frederick Raphael says that co-star Sidney Pollack had a hand in finishing the project. Nicole Kidman said, quote, I think Stanley would have been tinkering with it for the next 20 years. He was still tinkering with his movies he made decades ago. He was never finished. It was never perfect enough. There's evidence to support this, as Kubrick was making cuts on 2001 on the way to its premiere, and The Shining even after its release. According to one of Kubrick's daughters, weeks after Kubrick's death, the movie still had to be finished with additional dubbing and music. Quote, We just executed what he had already decided, so we faithfully did our job. Which brings us to the studio-made cuts. In order to dodge an NC-17, a box office kiss of death, and secure an R, Warner Brothers had to focus on the infamous orgy sequence, ultimately digitally adding bodies to block the excessive nudity. This move did not sit well with cinephiles, with many critics blasting the MPAA as out of control and trampling the freedom of American filmmakers. But Warner Brothers got the final say on the theatrical release, although thankfully the uncensored version became widely available later on. Eyes Wide Shut had a tight and unusual marketing campaign. Posters were normally supervised by Kubrick himself, but duties would now fall on his daughter. Her designs were rejected by the studio for shielding the faces of Cruz and Kidman in masks, although the masks are clearly Cruz and Kidman. Instead, they ended up being framed within a mirror. Still a strong poster, but the originals are definitely worth a look. Upon release, just about everybody was unsure what to expect from the haunting final masterpiece by Stanley Cooper. It didn't help that the director didn't even permit production notes in the press kit. Eyes Wide Shut was released on July 16, 1999, just four months after the director's death, opening at number one with $21.7 million. It would go on to gross $162 million worldwide, becoming Stanley Kubrick's highest grossing film. Not too shabby for a nearly three-hour erotic thriller about a man having a marital crisis during the holiday season, Eyes Wide Shut was reviewed fairly well, but there was still some disappointment, criticism, and confusion, which Kubrick's daughter said was because viewers were expecting something more salacious and not as serious. What was it even about? It's open to interpretation, but the themes of anonymity, secrecy, fidelity, relationships, and more are as blatant as the ending of 2001. Oh, wait. More than two decades later, Eyes Wide Shut is generally considered one of the greatest films of the 1990s, and even ranks on some best of all time lists. Like They Shoot Pictures, Don't They's list of the 1,000 greatest, ranking around 300 for the past several years. Okay, so all but two of Kubrick's movies rank, but it's higher than Full Metal Jacket, Spartacus, and others. As far as Stanley Kubrick's own thoughts, while he may not rank it alongside White Man Can't Jump, which is inexplicably one of his favorite movies, but he did have admiration. However, according to R. Lee Ermey, he told me it was a piece of and that he was disgusted with it. He said Cruz and Kidman had their way with him. Todd Field and Kubrick's own daughter both rebuked this, with the latter saying, quote, He was proud of most of his films, but he was very proud with Eyes Wide Shut. Kubrick's assistant, Jan Harlan, confirmed that the director thought it was maybe his greatest work. In other words, R. Lee Ermey was full of it. But we'd never tell him that. I got your name! I got your ass! 